Richard Allen Franklin, July 30th, 1929. Okay. And where were you born? And can you tell me briefly about your family background? Sure. I was born in Los Angeles. My mother was born in Los Angeles. My father moved here as an infant. So I have seen Los Angeles from 1929 forward. Mm. Uh, my uh, basic ancestry is from Russia. And uh, wow, you grew I, up and you grew up here. I've, uh, wow. I'm a pharmacist, and my father was a pharmacist, and I own quite a few pharmacies in the LA area. Yeah, yes, right now we are in LA for those people that are watching this that don't know. Um, so before we get into your background, of military background, can you tell me your educational background leading up to the moment that you joined the military? Uh, well, I, I went to college at USC, University of Southern California, College of Pharmacy. I graduated in 1950, passed my board exams in July of 1950. Korean War started in June of 1950. I was drafted into the military in December of 1950. What kind of basic training did you receive and where was it held? Okay, if, as everybody in this area went to military basic at Fort Ord, California for eight, six weeks, I think, infantry basic. Then because I was a pharmacist, they sent me to Brook Army Hospital to take uh, medical uh, basic training. While I was there, I contracted the measles, which was going around the camp, mm -hmm. went to the hospital isolation ward, where I received a, uh, information that went around, that if you were in one of these categories, you could become an instant officer. And uh, whether rightly or wrongly being a pharmacist, I decided, why should I be a private? I'll be a second lieutenant which of course was the start of my downfall. <laughs> oh, okay. So when you, so tell me which military were you a part of and what unit was it called? Uh, well, how far back do you want to go from the start? Um, yes, Korean <laughs> War. Yeah. Well, I was assigned, when I became a second lieutenant, I was assigned, assigned to the uh, First Armored Division, which was supposed to go to Germany. But by the time December of 51, anyway, or 50, MacArthur decided he was going to go to the Chinese border. And instead of the war being over, uh, the war intensified. And my unit was then a replacement unit. I ended up in Korea in late February, early March, 1952, was assigned to the 3rd Battalion Medical Company, 35th Regiment, 25th Division, which at that time had just moved to the Punch Bowl area of Korea, which was in the dead of winter. Oh yeah, February, right? Very cold. Yeah. So you said punch bowl area. Um, 1952, mm. March 1st. Okay. And at that time, uh, the 35th Regiment was uh, online. The 3rd Battalion, which I was the assistant battalion surgeon mm. at the aid station, uh, was there and uh, although they were doing, the, the war had stabilized somewhat in March in 52. Mm -hmm. They were always running patrols and fighting over hilltops. And uh, actually the first night I was there, my doctor said, I said, who was a very nice guy from Boston named Joe Connors. He was my doctor and I was the the executive, the CEO, I guess, mm -hmm. of the medical company, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, 
I said, where will I sleep, Joe? And he said, well, we're going to give you a good spot to sleep. I slept on a litter between two oil drums. That was the good spot. Um. Went to sleep in the middle of the night. I woke up and there were about four or five soldiers bleeding in the middle of my aid station. So that was my introduction mm. to the war in Korea. Before you got to Korea, did you know anything about Korea? No. Hmm. Oh, I knew there was a war, obviously, yeah. but I knew nothing about Korea, other than where it was, basically. And did I didn't you... know there was a going to be a North and a South and communists and uh, non and democracy and all this stuff. Yeah. And when you were there, did you also interact with Korean War, uh, Korean soldiers? Uh, not very much, although we had a Korean division on our right flank mm. uh, when I first got there. We had a Turkish uh, regiment on our left flank. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were much more secure about the Turkish soldiers than we were about the South Koreans at that time. Because mm. Turkish soldiers have been soldiers for a long time. South Koreans were new at this war business, right. unfortunately. Right. And what was your first impression of Korea? You just shared about your introduction to being in Korea yeah. was... My introduction was not very good. It was 10 below zero, yeah. people bleeding around me. And uh, I just, you know, I was a young guy, 20, 22 years old, 21, right out of college. And I was... a uh, just hoping to survive this uh, right. this experience, right. which fortunately I did. Mm -hmm. But we did have some Korean uh, non-military associated with our medical uh, uh, company. Mm -hmm. They did odd jobs and stuff. And unfortunately, actually, one of them got hurt and we took care of him. And when did you leave Korea? How long were you there for? Mar middle of March 1953. Okay. I was there two winters and one summer. Mm. So, thinking back, can you, can you tell me um, any details about um, maybe what were some of your most difficult times that you remember, most dangerous times? Well, when I first got there, it was quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of casualties in our battalion, and uh, we, of course, had the helicopters come in and take these patients back to the MASH hospitals, the Mobile Army hospitals. Mm -hmm. And whenever a helicopter would come in, the mortar rounds would come in from the Chinese and the North Koreans, and there was always danger, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have only, fortunately, only one medic was uh, killed while I was there, which was an unfortunate, but at least only one, and he was at a forward aid station mm -hmm. uh, that we had up on the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. Were and, you? And then we had an ex. When I was also in the Heartbreak Ridge area in June, July, and August of '52, which was also not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, the front lines were on a hilltop and the opposite hill were the Chinese. And to get back to company headquarters or battalion, you had to go across this valley and where the Chinese were always throwing mortar rounds and artillery rounds. We had a few tanks sitting in there and uh, we had casualties there. Uh, were you yourself wounded anywhere? Oh, no. Oh, that's no. great. Yeah. So you mentioned Heartbreak Ridge and the Punch Bowl. And then some. And then we went into reserve and we were on Kobe Doe Island, or Kobe Island, where they had a prisoner of war camp. We were there. Uh, our regiment was there guarding the prisoners, uh, part of the group guarding the prisoners there for... Uh, I think we were there about two and a half months. Mm. And then we ba went back online someplace, I don't remember, some some area, and it was winter again. Mm. And then uh, we went into reserve the rest of the time I was here. 
So the whole time that you were there, was it just always hectic and busy, or did you? Uh, well, no, no. I was uh, after the first seven months I was there. Then I was wasn't with the aid station anymore. They made me a motor mess and supply officer at the medical company headquarters. So then the only time I was around the front line, I had to climb up the mountain and inspect the kitchen mm -hmm. to be sure that I couldn't believe I had to do that. But in any event, inspecting kitchens on the front line was ridiculous. Oh. These guys were glad they had something to eat. They didn't care if it came out of a clean or a dirty kitchen. Wow. But anyway, that was the only time I was there. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, missing trucks. I'd have to go out and find them. We'd have... Uh, once in a while, I'd ask the mess sergeant to make donuts, which was fun, mm. and <laughs> and uh, I drove through the countryside. You know, did see oh. some of the Korean countryside, which was basically very pretty. Okay. Yeah, yeah I wanted to ask: Did you, you get any chances to just kind of tour that area? Uh, kind of leisurely? Well, just as so. part of my job, basically, I would. I did have some tours of countryside and mm -hmm. saw some people on the road and working farms and mm -hmm. selling produce and mm -hmm. it was, you know, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Did Su Pusan, I was in Pusan for a while because that's where you took the boat to the island where we were working. Okay. And uh, of course it was just a very busy old port at mm -hmm. that time now. And of course Seoul was nothing but rubble. Mm. There was no soul. I see. When I went back to revisit, it was a gorgeous modern city. Yeah, right. Because you mentioned you went back five years ago. Yes. Yeah. I want to ask you more about that in a bit. Um, so you said you did, you met some civilians, Korean civilians. Well, you did, Brief. I didn't, it did briefly. I didn't. Okay. The only ones I knew were the, the young boys who worked in the, around mm. my aid station or around the medical company headquarters mm. and they were doing odd jobs okay. you know any um other servicemen or anyone that any of your colleagues that you remember that you were working closely with well i remember or? of course my doctor joe connor who was very very good doctor a young guy and very efficient did a good job master sergeant I knew very well who was the sergeant at the aid station, Billy Drake, who I did see on my return briefly. He was at Brook Army Hospital where I was the last three months of my service. And I did locate him briefly in North Carolina and talk to him briefly about four years ago. And then subsequently he passed away. So, but those are the only two people really I mean, I knew him, but after the fact, I, I really didn't know anybody. We just did our jobs. I knew everybody I worked with. We had a ambulance lieutenant. We had uh, all these people. Hmm. Lots of, I think we had about 30 servicemen with the aid station between the jeep drivers and the litter bearers and the you know, the, the aid station people and the medics. Okay. You mentioned that uh, you showed me a book earlier saying uh, it has the details of the punch bowl and the the places that you're at. Anything that you, so far you have not seen written in books that you know? Uh, not really. Oh. I don't think so. Oh. Well, there's a few things that happen, of course. Uh, I don't... This, it was funny at the time, but uh, when I was in the uh, Heartbreak Ridge area, uh, they had a machine gun at the entrance to the canyon, to where these hills were. And one night the machine gun went off. So the battalion commander, a major, said, I, I can't seem to reach them on this phone. I'm going to go down and see what's going on. He said, I want all the cooks, the medics, the people to be out with their weapons. Mm -hmm. So all of us are lined up. God forbid we'd have pulled the trigger, we'd have killed all our own men. 
none of us knew what we were doing with these <laughs> rifles. And when the Major came back, he said, don't shoot, it's the Major coming back. He thought he was going to get shot to death. But it was, it was a, thank God no one was there. <laughs> but there were wounded, but it was from the tanks. Oh. The machine guns were from the tanks, and they did have some wounded, actually, which is in this resume that I have, mm. which told about that area, that time. Uh, other than that, uh, oh, one time I had to take inventory at the PX because they were missing things. They thought somebody was stealing stuff out of the PX, so that was a job. One day a truck was missing. I had to go see if I could find the truck. One time they had an accident. I was the one who did the investigation of the accident report. But basically, you know. That's what I did. Okay, thank you. Um, should we, can I ask you, how was it to go back to Korea? How did it happen and then what was it like when you were there? What did you do? Well, I had finally decided I would join this Korean War Veterans Association. They had a magazine, a quarterly magazine. On one of the issues they said, uh, there's still room to go to revisit Korea. Uh, and I didn't know what they were talking about. So I called up this number and they said, yes, since 1975, the Korean government has been bringing a hundred veterans with their family, if they had someone, one, two people could go to, as a thank you. And it was amazing. I mean, they paid for the airfare the hotel, the food, the tours. We got so many gifts that some of us had to buy extra <laughs> suitcase to bring the gifts. It was amazing. And the people were so nice and so appreciative, the Korean people. I mean, I got pictures standing next to the one of the vice presidents of the country. They gave you medals. Uh, and I, I I don't know if I told you I was there during Veterans Week at a G8 conference, mm -hmm. and on Veterans Day, Obama was there at the G8 conference. So the President of the United States gave the speech on Veterans Day for the soldiers who were and the veterans who were there. And actually, we did have a uh, Medal of Honor winner in our group, oh. which was very unusual. Oh, wow. Yeah. Who is that person? I, 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 I have his name okay. someplace. I don't remember his name. Wow. But the president did come over and yeah. talk to him. Wow. And so when you, going back to in 1953, I guess, when you came back, yes. what, what was it like coming back home? It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem was my last three months I was assigned back to San Antonio which I, is, at that time was not the greatest town in the world. And, uh, but, uh, and basically people, I mean, it was not like coming home from World War II. Mm. You know, nobody seemed to really care very much about the returning veterans. We came home, we went back to whatever we were doing, and basically that was it. Mm. Only the families of the soldiers who were there really cared a lot. I mean, there may have been some, but we weren't aware of it, mm. which was kind of sad, actually. Did you, and after you came back, did, have you often thought about Korea? Well, occasionally, yes, actually. You know, I have a bunch of pictures, of course, and every once in a while I'd look back at the pictures and you'd think about it. Mm. And, of course, it was very uh, rewarding that South Korea really became a wonderful country and had we not been there mm -hmm. they would have been under the communists like North Korea and mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been this, the country it is today right, right. which is probably why the South Koreans realize that right. and have been so appreciative right, right. yes which is very nice yeah. actually as, as far as I know South Korea is the only country which has said thank you this way mm. 
to the United States for helping them save their countries, which mm -hmm. is very nice. I see. Yes. And to you, what does what impact did Korean War have in your life? Well, it was a very maturing experience for a 21-year-old. Yeah. That's basically. <laughs> and also, I was certainly glad to get home. Right. And you said after you came back, um, you worked in L.A. Then as a I, pharmacist. Then I had my own pharmacies, yeah. and I owned many pharmacies in Los Angeles, actually. Great. Great. Anything else that you would like to say to the camera so that... Um, the younger generations can continue to learn about the Korean War history? Well, there are numerous books. There is a Korean War Veterans Association, which they can look up on the web, which can give them a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Now, there is, of course, a Korean memorial in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. which I haven't seen, but I understand is very, very nice. And uh, there's many places to to find information, and uh, it was a quite a dramatic part of American history, and I think all young people should have some understanding of what was going on at that time of the, the you know, that was the Cold War and all this stuff was going on. Right. Yeah. And basically, that's about all I can tell you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. <laughs>